We are live. Uh, this is Emil Fisher with another episode of the BCTL podcast. Uh, with me today, I have uh, 2008, a member of the 2008 Olympic team, Andy Rovat. Uh, Andy is a Cleveland area native. I, I actually met him uh, training at Strong Style. Uh, he came in a few times to train and we hit it off. Uh, super good dude. So I wanted to bring him on. Um, he's got a lot of really unique perspectives, and I wanted to chat with him a little bit. How's it going, Andy? Oh, it's going well. Give me a second while I share this with all all the people on Facebook. For you know, sure. Thanks. You know, if you haven't heard, you know, if, if you're not familiar with the 2008 Olympic team, it was an impressive lineup. They had uh, Daniel Cormier, Ben Askren, Henry Cejudo, and course andy rovat over here um you wrestled greco right no freestyle freestyle okay i wasn't sure if it was greco or freestyle i know you've done greco or have you not uh not since high school okay in high school okay yeah and um i mean what, what other than wrestling for the olympic team what are your major i guess accolades major uh things that you've gotten to do so i grew up in cleveland wrestled at st ed's i was a two-time state champ uh, three-time finalist. Uh, then I went to Michigan. I uh, wrestled there four years. I was a uh, three-time All-American. I won University Nationals, uh, which is USA Wrestling, College Nationals. I won that twice. was a uh, three-time Pan Am medalist, Pan Am Silver, Pan Am Games Silver medalist. Uh, wrestled at the 2006 World Championships. I was on the U.S. national team four years, which is top three. And then, um, then yeah, then I lived in – then I was the only non-Russian wrestler to live a year in the Caucasus Mountains to learn the Russian training system. In the Caucasus – so, I mean, that's a really interesting, uh, I guess, part of your story that you were out there and you trained with that group of people. Um, is that Dagestan or where is that exactly in – in it's Russia. near Dagestan, right? And so okay. um, so the Caucasus Mountains go, it's the southernmost point of Russia, I, I, essentially. There might be a little southern tip out by Japan, China, but they, the western part, it's the southernmost western part. And so, like, if you go straight down, it's like Moscow all the way down. And then it's like on the western part, it's like Ukraine, Belarus, like Bulgaria, and then... Um, there's uh, the Black Sea and then there's the Caspian Sea. So connecting the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea is the uh, Cox Mountains. Mm -hmm. And so the Sochi Olympics were there in 2014, I believe. And uh, and so, yeah, so uh, I was in right dead smack the middle of the Cox Mountains. So just north of Georgia, it's a republic called North Ossetia, Alania. And the people that live there, they're Christian. Um, they they were inhabited there since Genghis Khan. And so essentially they had a huge kingdom north of the Caucasus Mountains, south of Moscow. Uh, and they were like, they broke out the Persian Empire 1,800 years ago, and they still speak a dialect of Farsi continuously since then. And so that's their own language. And when Genghis Khan came west, he went north from Tartarstan down to the Caucasus Mountains and went south through Persia and up through Georgia. And so he trapped all of these tribal people in the Caucasus Mountains because there were nomads that were nomads on the Eurasian steppe that he ruled. And so he wanted to get all these tribal people into one area. And so um, eventually religion came in there. And so the Osatians, the Alanians, which is their ancient name, they chose Christianity and then Chechnya was next to them. They chose um, Islam, and then Dagestan is next to them. So it, from east to west, it's Chechnya, or Dagestan, Chechnya, Os Ossetia, and then next to Ossetia is Karbadina Bukharia, and, and they're Islamic as well. And so it's kind of a very diverse uh, region, uh, very small. I think it's something like half the size of New Jersey. Jeez. But uh, but you know, Dagestan alone, they have like. 30 distinct tribes in 30 distinct languages in just such a tiny little area. It'd be like Northeast Ohio. Yeah. 
So you were sent over there. If I, if I read it correctly, um, you were contacted by Shale Son and, and, and he sent you over there, um, you know, to, to stay, to study there for a year. Cause they are remarkably good wrestlers. Um, I mean, I, I know that I'm sure that there's, you probably could talk about that experience you know, for way longer than we have today. But if there were like one critical element of what they're doing that is allowing them to win at such a high level, what would you say that one element is? Oh man, one element for them. <laughs> or two. Well, no, it, it's um no one element. I mean, compared to the US for wrestling, it's they have a systematic approach. That's the one element for sure. Okay. Right. We're like the U.S., every high school, every college, every coach has their experience and like, oh, I'll just do it based on my experience. And the Russians developed a system that came out of World War II um, when the Germans and the Russians, uh, sorry, when the U.S. and the Russians sacked Germany, like Berlin, when it, they finally captured it, um, they were fighting for all the scientists. And I mean, they had a ton of engineers and doctors and they had a ton of, uh, I, I don't know, you know, like NASA was started by German scientists. Right. Mm -hmm. And so Russian took a bunch of scientists that that studied the human body because, you know, Germans, they wanted to create the, the master race and they wanted to make superhumans. Right. And so the Russians took those doctors and said, look, we, we want to know what you know. And so that was like really early on. And so they knew like the metabolic pathways for training and the different periodizations for that. They knew human development, like what you could learn eight and under what you could learn, you know, from eight to 24 before your prefrontal cortex is developed. And, and so it's, it's a very holistic approach um, that is replicable through studies. And, and so they took those scientists and said, Oh, you know, cause they were, the, they were the Soviet union. They were the people's Republic. They wanted to, optimize the workers as well and so like one of the first studies they did was on ditch diggers and they and they figured out how to paradise work to optimize people's output that's super interesting man um i know that there's uh, some articles that are that have been written about that that trip for you and it's just it's such a fascinating part of uh your journey and the things you've gotten to do um now you've also dabbled a little bit in some jujitsu you've also done quite a bit of yoga um what do you think has been for you the most challenging athletic endeavor that you've embarked upon you know outside of wrestling you mean or just outside of wrestling yeah yeah, I mean, wrestling is going to be, you know, because of the amount of time you put into it, the amount of effort, the level you reach, that's going right. to naturally be the highest uh, performance thing that you've done. But as far outside of wrestling, what's been like the toughest thing for you? I would say yoga, right? Like, so I took four months and I did it every day for four months, hot yoga. And it was hard, you know, at first it was hard because when I was a wrestler, they were like, okay, do traditional lifts, bench press, overhead press, you know, like the heavy squats. And I was never tested physically, right? And so you have a lot of physical attributes. You have strength, flexibility, mobility, balance and movement, right? And so I was always tested strength, but over time through wrestling, I really started lacking flexibility and mobility. It was just never included in training. And so to be able to learn that, but also by doing it and applying it in real time, that that was mind blowing, um, you know, just because I saw the progress. But then, I, you know, I saw my balance improve. I saw my mobility improve, my flexibility improve. Um, you know, I was always able to move really well, but um, but some of those were, were very difficult and they're still difficult, you know, like my chest and my shoulders are messed up from wrestling from being hunched over and not fixing them. My hips are messed up because, you know, I didn't have the, I, I never spent enough time on my um, hip flexors and it makes sense, right? Like wrestlers are hunched over like this, their, their butts out there, you know, like your hip flexors aren't always engaged. So it's like the ap absolute opposite. Right. And so you just got to start getting pulled in weird ways. 
And uh, that was, it's, a, it's still a struggle to get all that mobility and flexibility back. That's good, man. That's a good answer. So with yoga, um, have you tried things other than hot yoga or are you specifically focused on hot yoga? Well, I like hot just because of the sweating aspect, but I've done, um, you know, I've done some like yin yoga where it's like holding poses and getting deeper in mobility. But, but my philosophy is that if you continue to do it every day and there's, there's small elements of mobility and flexibility built into that every day, well, then you're going to see greater gains than just taking one day and focusing on hip, opening up your hips and one day and focusing on your shoulders. Um, and so little improvements every day lead, lead to uh, huge gains. Now, I know one thing that you uh, were telling me about back when we first met each other and that I, I'm sure has developed is that you have built a program uh, specifically for youth wrestling and, and you're trying to get it um, kind of out here in the United States. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. So I have a program. It, it started with wrestling. Um, so I just blind faith. I knew nothing. I, I took a journal to Russia, wrote it down, everything I did. I studied the juniors, some high school and then all the Olympic level. And I came back and just blind faith. I started running it. And uh, probably after like a year and a half, I got contacted by Mike Barwis, and he was a strength coach at Michigan. He was my coach for the Olympics, for, for training, for athletic training. And um, he contacted me and said, hey, I know what you're doing. Uh, I want you to train my kids. I mean, and this is a guy who's helped like 200 people walk again. He developed a neurological reengineering program for people with, um, that have been paralyzed. And so he just knew the human body like amazing, but I was training people blind faith. And so he helped me understand some of the science of why it worked because the Russians taught me that they didn't tell me the why they were like, you got to go figure that out yourself. And, um, and so I figured it out with him and, uh, you know, I, I took progressions and I just broke it down from the highest level. And I said, look, if you want to figure out, if you want to be an Olympic level athlete, you have to have physical, you have to have, full control of yourself physically. You have to have physical literacy. And mm -hmm. so that broke down to the kids program. And then once you understood the physical literacy, then you're like, okay, well, next is a technical component. Well, then I saw, okay, well, it, that took me like three, four years to understand the chest, uh, the technical component. And it wasn't until I heard Josh Whiteskin speak about how he learned chess that I was like, oh shit, like they learned this from chess. And so, um, so I figured out how they learned the technique part of wrestling. And then, then that was like, okay, well, now the mental component of the system. And then I learned the mental co component. And, and then after that, then I had training for youth, middle school, junior high, high school, and Olympic level all built into to one platform that is built on progressions by age and, and physical development. It's interesting you bring up Josh Whiteskin. You know that he's a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu under Marcelo Garcia. Right. And so it, it's, it's super that. interesting because the, the – the, and I, I play chess as well. I'm assuming you probably play chess at times. Never. Never? Never. never. Oh, man. The, the, the way that movement patterns develop is actually not entirely different from the way, like, chess patterns develop especially right. for jiu-jitsu and grappling because the idea, you know, you have your, your trees, like, you know, if you do this, you have these options and you right. kind of map that. Um, so I'm assuming that a lot of what you have done, do, do you need to take care of something? No, not at all. There's people coming. I'm just making sure everything's okay. Okay, great. So as of late, you've been working with, uh, you've been working on a new project. You're, you're doing something new right now. I, I'm sure you'd like to tell people about that. Yeah. So you can see by the shirt, I'm, uh, I'm working for Spartan and we are starting Spartan combat. And so we have an apparel line coming out and that they're going to be hosting all of my training, um, for youth wrestling, uh, middle school, junior high and high school. And then, um, and then we're also going to have a physical literacy class for kids of all ages to, um, teach them how to control themselves because 
um, you know, like you said, and, and um, well, I don't know if you said it, but, but yeah, you, you know, jujitsu and wrestling is a sport that you get rewarded for controlling someone else. And so uh, if you can't control yourself first physically, and if you have a physical limitation, then there's going to be um, limitations in how you can control another human being. So if you eliminate your physical limitations, um, it'll be easier for you to control another man or a woman. Now you've trained it off the top of my head. I can think of three, three jujitsu academies. You've probably trained it more than three, but I, I know you trained with uh, Victor Torres a little, little bit. You've trained a little right. bit at strong style and you trained a little bit at Marcelo Garcia uh, in New York city. Um, what are the major differences between the way jujitsu academies do things and the way that wrestling does things? And what are some of the pitfalls that you see and some of the advantages? Yeah, so, um, you know, I'm, I, I haven't been able to spend enough time at each of them. Right. But, uh, but one, I see, well, I'll just say the pitfalls. One, it's the lack of warm up um, to include physical literacy in the warm up. Um, if you want to tra train, you should have a routine that you go through every day that hits on all your physical characteristics. Because if you could do that when you're done with that, even if it's like a 15 minute warm up, when you're done with that warm up, then mentally you're in a state like, okay, well, now I'm, I'm, I know my body's ready. And now I can um, know what I have to give for the rest of the practice, right? Um, so that's one thing that, that I don't see a lot in the jujitsu community. The other thing is teaching at the end. The number one thing that I, that I would say that I learned in terms of giving the benefits of the athletes from the Russian system is they always teach at the end. Because there's nothing worse than warming up and then listening to an instructor teach hypothetical situations that may not occur in your style or your approach to the sport. And so what the Russians do is that they run through the practice and they have situations that they do every day. And that a lot of jujitsu um, places that I've been to have situations like you'll start in half guard or full guard or, you know, maybe right. like st side position or something. And it'll be, you know, my terminology is not the greatest, but you yeah, know, yeah. different right? There's different situations you can start in. Well, the teaching will be based on one of the situations that you compete in, but it'll be at the end. So then as the coach wants to help improve positive or negative, they can say, okay, Emil, when you were in this situation, you were controlling the situation this way and going in this direction. What works the best is if you control the situation like this, and then these are the finishing directions from there. And so that way you have real life feedback from your own mind. And it's not hypothetical. It's, it's actual real life feedback. Right. And so, but you could also say positive, Hey, that was great. How you were controlling um, that situation. Your finishes were amazing. Um, you know, you're going in the right direction. Um, and so that's the biggest thing that I see that would keep people more engaged because like I said, there's nothing worse than warming up, getting ready and then just sitting down and listening to someone talk. But you're more focused when you get all that energy out, you get to have fun battle right away. And then you could sit down, slow your mind down and then run through the positions that you had already been in. And so you could be like, then you could start sparring those positions. Like, okay, if I'm controlling this, here's the finish. Control this, get to the finish. Gotcha, man. That's, uh, that's a good point. I, I know that um, I've seen it done both ways. I think it's much more popular the way that you're describing warm up, then teaching, and then live training. So I'd be interested in seeing if there was ever an academy that really did that long term, if they saw a difference. Um, one thing I, I think is super interesting just from having trained with you briefly is that when you do jujitsu, you are far more interested in doing jujitsu. Like a lot of times people have this misconception when they come to jujitsu from wrestling. And I see it a lot with like lower level wrestlers, like a guy that wrestled in high school, but that's about it. Or, you know, somebody that wrestled in college, but didn't really accomplish much. But one thing I noticed was that when you came over, you were like, no, I want to do this jujitsu stuff. Uh, share that mindset a little bit with me because I found that really fascinating. 
Yeah. So, and, and, and again, I'm going to relate to like American wrestling. And so American wrestling didn't understand how the Russians teach technique based on the chess. And so they only know one thing of the sport. And I remember when you, when you, when we first started training together, you were like, you know, every wrestler wants to just move in directions, move in directions, move in directions. And my whole thing was, I just want to control the situation, be comfortable in the situation, understand what your A and B moves are and, and figure out a way where I can go from that situation. Right. Um, and, and so that gets to like, so American wrestling, they always drill. So like before you wrestle live, you drill. So, um, so I'll go back even a little further. So to, for me, technique is two things, right? There's only two parts of technique. It's, it's what you can control and what direction you can go in, right? So you have your direction of attack, what part of the body you can control after attacking, and then the direction of finish. Um, in American wrestling, especially high school and college, they're like, they're, they go right to the attack, right to the finish, right to the attack, right to the finish, and they never stop and they're never met with resistance because that's drilling, right? Drilling is a repetition of movement. Well, for me, sparring is more focused on control and then learning what direction you could finish right so it's like it's like strangling somebody it's like a cobra right like you adjust readjust readjust that to me that's sparring because you're focused on the control and then you're slowly going into that next direction that you can move in and then you may get in another whole nother position and you're like okay well now i'm just going to go slow 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 in, into another direction of finish right so there's different points we could stop in the middle. It's not going from A to B as fast as you can. And if you do that in jujitsu, I just knew that was a terrible strategy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was just, it was something that I, I've seen you do. And I've seen a couple of other really high level wrestlers, like, you know, national champion level, or, you know, like in your case, Olympian level wrestlers, they aren't trying to beat jujitsu with wrestling. They're right. trying to learn jujitsu for the purpose of actually learning jujitsu. And it, it's a super interesting mindset because of the fact that it's so uncommon among wrestlers that enter the sport. You see so many wrestlers that really build an entire game around their wrestling. And it, I'm sure you could. It just, I don't know how interesting that would be for you. No, man. And well, that's why, and that's also why I like gi over no gi. Um, you know, Nogi was too much like wrestling for me. And it's more when I was training a little bit at strong style, it, it felt more like a ton of hip control, right? Because there's more movement, but you got to keep those hips, you know, from people being able to hip pipes and move around and pass your guard. And to me, it was more like in wrestling when we trained our failed attack, because if you don't get to the leg, when you attack the leg, you're in like a front, seat, well, front headlock, a seat belt, you're like in 50, 50 positions. And it just felt more like that. But the gi, I just, I loved it because it was, it was super controlled. It's a slower game. Um, you have to think harder um, yeah. to try to trick somebody. So it's, it's interesting. I like it. I want that. I want that uh, big, big uh, gi super fight. <laughs> I want to find somebody. Well, we got we got somebody we got somebody watching right now in the comments here who uh, might be able to help you with that at some point. Yeah, Josh, how you doing, Josh? But yeah, um, I am. We are. Mo I am monitoring the comments here. If anybody has any questions for Andy, Andy is just a fountain of knowledge when it comes to grappling in general, specifically wrestling, obviously because of his status as an elite wrestler. Um, what do you think was the most defining moment for your career as a wrestler? Like, was there a specific moment where it was like things started to kind of click for you or things started to kind of go in a special direction for you? Yeah, I would say, I would say my freshman year. And so, you know, I, I graduated high school in 1998 and, you know, at, during that time ESPN didn't have the nationals for college all the time. You know, now they're live every session um, so you can see every match, uh, you could see matches streaming. And so like NCAAs were at Cleveland state my freshman year or my senior year of high, high school. 
And so I watched the NCAAs and I was like, man, I'm going to be an NCAA champion or uh, all American next year. Right. And um, are they done? You get, are you going to get Alex? Yeah. Cool. Thank you. I'm sorry. I had to get, um, I'm filming right now, but I'm just uh, producing. So um, they're getting to people. So yeah. So my fresh, my freshman year of college, you know, I told everybody after watching nationals as a senior in Cleveland, I'm going to be an all American. I'm going to be all American. I had a good, good freshman year, but the college seasons are a lot longer. And so by the end of the season, like I was ranked in the top eight at some points during the season, but then at big tens, I had a terrible big 10, barely qualified um, for the NCAAs. I, I took seventh in the big 10, they qualified the top seven. And so I go to the NCAAs and I'm not seated. I wrestled the eighth seed first match, beat them, returning all American. I wrestled the ninth seed, beat him. I think he was a return all American. I lost to Kale Sanderson, who's four time NCAA champ, um, only undefeated, four time NCAA champion. Lost to him. And then to be an all American, I had to come back and wrestle Mark Munoz, who was, you know, in the UFC for a long time. And so Mark Munoz was the number three seed. And so I had to beat the number three seed to be an all American. I told everybody for the longest time, I'm going to be an all American. I'm going to be an all American. And the match is right. In, it's at Penn State. And the match was right in front of the Oklahoma State section. They were like, they had this whole corner of the arena. And I got out to an early lead. And he started coming back. And I was dying. But in my back of my mind, I said, I told so many people I was going to be an All-American. I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to not make it. And so it went into overtime. And just sure enough, like, right at overtime, boom, I tricked him, right? Like we had been in this position a couple of times throughout the day and I tricked him and he went one way. I went the other way and I popped out on top, got the takedown, jumped off of him and I was an all American. And ever since that moment, like, you know, I just knew that there was so much I was capable of doing in the sport. And, uh, you know, in high school, it was different because everybody was expected to do well at St. Ed's. But then I went to Michigan and it was uncharted territory. And so that was like a real defining moment for me in my career. And it just propelled me to being able to do a lot of things. So when you're out there in competition, do you find that self-belief is critical? Like, do you have to believe that you're going to win to win? I. Uh, it depends, right? Like, it dep I, I've talked to an Olympic champion who would tell himself that he's going to lose. This guy's going to rape his mom and wife. And he's going to murder his family. And his life is going to be miserable after this. And, but he used it in such a negative way that he was like, I got to win. I got to win. I can't let this happen, right? And so it's like, you can, you, I mean, it, it all depends, right? I'm a big believer that you could, you could have it all, right? And, and so the placebo effect's real. So depending on how you do it, you just have to believe in your method, right? And so obviously you want to have that belief, but um, there's other ways that you could motivate. <laughs> when you're out there competing, do you have any superstitions? Oh yeah, I did for sure, right? And and the, it's crazy because the longer you're in the sport, the more you get, right? You gotta you gotta check yourself. You're like, this is not important, right? Like, you had to have the same warm up gear, the same, you know, the same routine. The, you know, like five minutes before the match, I had to do fifty jumps, fifty push ups. Um, you just get, I don't know, you get so caught up. But routines are good. Too many are is not right because then it's like when shit hits a fan and, you, and you're not able to go through it, it's like, well, how are you able to adapt? Right. Yeah. It's funny. Cause we had, uh, I had Comprito on, on sat on Sunday. He's Pablo's instructor. He's a multiple time world champion. And he was saying that like for him, you know, he's trying to get rid of his superstitions always. No, that's cool. Right. <laughs> it's tough. Replace, excuse me. You got to replace him with something. Yeah, for sure. Um, so as far as, you know, your potential goals for the future, 
Uh, what are you looking at? Are you eyeing more jujitsu competition? Are you eyeing, you know, what what sort of uh, what sort of things are you trying to do, especially once all this nonsense with the COVID is over? Yeah, for sure. No, I I want to I want to do some key competitions or or you know maybe get a match up here and there. Um, I would love it. You know, the, uh, you know the last practice I was able to do was right before this pandemic hit. I, you know, I did that yoga for four months and that was a big thing for me because I wanted to prove the, the physical literacy part of it, right? Like there's a lot of breathing components in yoga, obviously the, the, the flexibility and mobility. And so I went to Marcelo Garcia's on the way to Boston to, to work this deal out with Spartan. And, you know, every time I go somewhere, I always want to take the, the biggest, baddest person and, you know, go with them. And so I felt so good that I was like, no, I could definitely do this, right? Like, I just got to get in the gym, do it a few times a week, you know, complement with some other training. But I do want to have, like, a training camp leading up to, like, some kind of cool competition, something fun, and, uh, you know, just go from there, right? Like, I mean, you know, I don't have long to be able to still fight some pretty good guys. Um you know, gi and is a little slower, and so an older man can do it. But um, I don't have that much time, and and so I want to be able to try it out a little bit, see see what it does, just for fun. You know, it's like, like I said, I'm 40 years old. There's no, there's not nothing to prove except just to, you know, take this new sport and see if I could um, take the technical knowledge of wrestling and how I learn it and teach it and apply it to another sport. Do you watch any uh, competitive jujitsu? I have based on your recommendations. I haven't in a while because of I'm doing, I was doing two live classes a day on the Spartan Facebook page. And now I'm filming three different classes um, for four different age groups. And so, uh, so yeah, that's taking a back seat. One thing I think is really interesting. Um, I've had, numerous people on that you know are active competitors and i always ask everybody what they think the next meta is in the sport and the response is pretty unanimously has been uh that it's going to be wrestling that wrestling for jujitsu is going to be like kind of the next big thing because the last few years it was leg locks um but i think that a lot of people have gotten a handle on that do you think that if wrestling is the next big meta in jujitsu, that's going to put you in a good position? Should you start competing actively? Maybe give me one second. There's sure. technical difficulties. Yep. Sure. So while Andy deals with whatever he is dealing with, I uh, just wanted to run through the upcoming schedule tomorrow evening. I have Mr. Jujitsu coming on. Oh, you're back. Yeah, I'm back. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So, um, that's interesting, right? Um, I, I think it all depends on. I think it all depends on, um, obviously, which style gear, no gi. Um, leg locks are huge, right? And and so there are. This is funny, right? And so, the way you stated that question, um, it reminds me. So when I first started coaching, I was working as the right hand man for Zeke Jones. You. Best national team coach. Now he's head coach at Arizona State, who were his alma mater. And in 2013, he took the world championships and he said, okay, the Russians are scoring from all these positions. And he broke it down. He said, this is the number one position, number one position. So we spent all the next year training in this position. And um, and so we go to the world championships. And so the seatbelt position in 13, we go 14 world championships. And the Russians scored so many points from a seat or from a fireman's. And Zeke was like, man, last year, it's like, that doesn't even correlate. Why was it one year? It was this. And next year it was that. And I, I started thinking, I was like, oh shit. Like they are determining the Russians were determining the statistics for the next year are in advance. And so mm-hmm. when Russians want to score a lot of points on, firemen they're training more frequently when they do their upper body positions they're training more frequently in a two-on-one because they're they're all masters at hitting a fireman's off a two-on-one um when they the year before when they were scoring on the seatbelt 
they were spending uh, more proportion of the time it, when they were doing failed attacks. When they were doing the failed attacks, um, they were spending more time on uh, seatbelt positions. And so, um, and, and so sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so, so yeah, spent a lot of time in the seatbelt position. And so that's why the guys were able to, that's why everybody was able to, I don't know, sorry. Um, I'm on a compound right now, by the way. We have 11 kids, oh, wow. um, like six Spartan workers. Uh, we have two videographers, two editors, um, social media, uh, a strength worker, um yeah mom's dad's yeah it's, it's fun <laughs> i wish i was out there that sounds like a blast yeah and we have a mountain that we hike every day we, i think today was like the 50th day we um hiked it nice man yeah that, so you know it's really interesting that you talk about you know so, yeah, study... yeah. we're saying yeah yeah so what i was gonna sorry i got because i got lost for a second but yeah okay. so like whatever that yeah. is whoever are the top gyms training, they're going to dictate what that is. So if they, if they're like, because leg locks will never go out of fashion, right? They'll come back because if you break it down to just control and direction, wrestling and jujitsu is a scripted dance because there's only so much you can control and only so many directions you can go in. Um, and, and so arm bars or leg locks will be popular. Um, you know, it'll come and go. How you get to the attack will be different popularities, right? Because, you know, I've seen a lot of people just going into guard or it's like, you know, if you don't think that's advantageous or people are gaming, then you may start training more wrestling style attacks to get to a, a different advantage point when you get into the guard, right? And so, so again, that, that'll be determined by who the, of the biggest – gyms how they're training and what their mindset is moving forward yeah so i guess you say that you know you don't think leg locks are ever going to go out of style and you know certainly there's very there's very little new material but on the other side of things i would argue that as people learn the defenses for stuff stuff that comes off of those defenses become the next meta and then right the result is always going to be this ever changing sport. Do you see the same sort of thing with wrestling? Yes. So, um, but in the exact opposite. So for that in wrestling is what I explained. The Russians is coming off of the attack and not off of the control, oh. right? Because jujitsu, you're, you're spending more time in the control. We're wrestling. You spend little time in control and you're getting to the finish right away. Um, but jujitsu, you're spending more time in the control and that's where you start getting into new, I don't, I don't know how to say it, but they're not final points, but they're new markers, right? Like if, if I do this, then you defend and now we're in, in a total different position and then we start moving around, then we're in a different position. So jujitsu, so what you're saying is we're saying the same thing, but one, you're, you're working backwards and one, you're working forwards. Right. If that makes sense. Right. It makes, that makes perfect sense. It's a, it's a difference in, in modality of training and modality of competition where you're trying to be ahead of the curve in wrestling. Whereas jiu -jitsu, most jujitsu is counter. Right. Right. Because you have, you have offense and defense and that's a lot of strategic too. Right. I would say the two philosophies and, and life and combat sports early bird gets the worm but the second mouse gets the cheese <laughs> yeah that's a good a, one attack, counter -attack. <laughs> I, I like that it's good early bird gets the worm but second mouse gets the cheese um when you are competing or when you were competing and i, I know that you know 2008 the 2008 olympics was a long time ago but at that point in time, did you do a lot of tape study on your opponents? Were you uh, preparing by watching your opponents ahead of time? I mean, I did some. Mostly the coaches did that on the opponents. I didn't like it um, because I had my game plan, right? Like, if they were going to do something like one side or this or that, it's like, okay, I'll be ready. But 
I wanted to stick to my game plan and just do it that way, right? Like, I just watched a lot of film, like a ton of film. Like, I watched the greats over and over and over again. World Olympic champions, like 10-time World Olympic champions, you know? Like, I just wanted to see, like, their approach and their mindset. And, and there's so many little nuances that I learned from them. But to, for me to be obsessed about a, a competitor, um, I was just going to impose my will on him. I didn't need to worry about what he was going to do. Like, I needed a little bit of information, but nothing to, but not too much where you're stressing out about it. Gotcha. Uh, who do you think, uh, if you had to, like, pick one wrestler in modernity, who do you think would be, like, the best wrestler, the goat of wrestling? Man, there's a couple. Um, mostly all Russians. So, Sergey Belaglazov, um, he's coaching where I used to coach in the, at the Michigan Regional Training Center, two-time Olympic champ, uh, six-time world champ. Uh, unbelievable technical-wise. Uh, and then right at the same time, um, Arsene Pizayev was like a five-time world champ, two-time Olympic champ. And um, so those two are considered probably top four in the history. And then on the same team, you had Marhabak Kadartsev, who was a two-time Olympic champ, Olympic silver medalist, uh, six-time world champ, and a world bronze medalist and a world silver medalist. And so I think he has 11 total medals. And he's not even considered among the greatest because he has a couple losses, right? <laughs> like, the guy's got, like, six or seven world titles. And I'm sorry, he had seven. He had seven. So he had five worlds, two Olympics, one world silver, one Olympic bronze. And so, like, those are, like, some of the most unbelievable. Two of them were in the city – that I trained at. Um, Sergey was from the Russian part of Russia, not the Caucasus Mountains. And then, uh, and then Bruvesar Satia was like a five time, six time world champ, three time Olympic champ. And he was from like the 90s to the 2000s. 2008 was his last year from 96 to 08. Yeah. That's crazy that he and was currently actually they have one at a different. Yes, yeah, that's long. He yeah. won it in '96. He won his first world title in '96, and then he won the Olympics in 2008. So, I, I I think I know what your answer is going to be because you know because of what you've done in your life. But if you had to pick one grappling sport as the hardest with the best athletes, would it be judo, jujitsu, wrestling? Could you repeat that? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. If you had to pick one grappling sport as the, the with the you know highest level athletes, what do you think it would be? And that I mean, includes I had to say wrestling. To, you know samba. Yeah, I had to, to say wrestling just because. I mean, MMA, which is mixed martial arts. You know, all the grappling sports are martial arts. Um, it's been around for so long. I, I mean, wrestling has more numbers, so maybe that's why it's skewed. But just the sheer number of UFC champions that, that wrestling has produced. And again, it may be sheer numbers or just cultural. Like maybe, you know, judo teaches something so different that they're like, look, we're not fighters. We don't, we're not going to get people into that part of the sport. So, um, but just based on that observation, um, I would have to say wrestling just because like so many UFC champions have been wrestlers. That's fair. That's fair. Speaking of which, this Saturday, one of your buddies is fighting. So he's, you know, fighting, think... he's fighting a female, right? Yeah, he's fighting Valentina Shevchenko. No, so... <laughs> it's funny. Um, you know, that's a, that, that, that was a fun joke, man. That, that took out a lot of attention. Um, so, in that in those two main events, you have Justin Gaethje versus Tony Ferguson. Then you have Henry Cejudo versus Dominic Cruz. Um, wh who wins each of those fights, and how do you think? That's a tough one, you know. Like Gaethje's a beast, you know, but I mean they both are. Like I like them both. Um, 
I might uh, just to pick. I'll go with Gaethy, Gaethy just because I think he's more solid. I mean, Ferguson's amazing, but like he's a wild card because um, he, he's like he moves so much, right? And it's yeah. so unorthodox, but which is also why he wins. But he opens himself up for more. Um, so I'm gonna go with Gaith, Gaith, Justin Gaethy on that. I can't say his name. Gaethy. Um, <laughs> Gaethy. And uh, and I'm about to pick Cejudo. I mean, the guy's won Ooh. so much. Um, you know, again, Dominic Cruz is super uh, solid, but so is Cejudo, and he's just a little younger. And uh, if Cruz doesn't open up, then I don't think there's a chance he could win. You know, and he's got to really open up. And I don't know how long he's been off of fight. I don't know when his last fight or how frequently he's been fighting. Because I know he's doing a lot of commentating. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think Suhudo has the advantage because of that. Not because of the commentating, but just because, like, I just don't see him opening up enough to take him out, right? Like, he's going to want to go blow for blow with him, you know? He's not going to try to wrestle him. And he's yeah. really good on his feet, you know? Cruz is super good on his feet. But, uh but yeah, I mean, I just think Cejudo will eventually. He, his movement's really good. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty excited to watch that entire card. I mean, it's uh, it's crazy with what's going on in the world that they're still going to have a UFC event, right? No fans though, right? I don't. I, yeah, I think I think no fans. I mean, so what do you what do you think is going to be the long term outcome of all this? When do you think that? Uh, you know, stuff's going to start really opening back up as far as combat sports go. Man, like, combat sports people are going to – I mean, there's going to be a group of people in the country that are like, no, this uh, – we're going to all die. And then there's going to be another group of people like, come on, like, you can't believe everything you hear. <laughs> you know, like, there's two sides to every coin. And so, like, people want connection. People want purpose. You know, we could do all we want to – fight mother nature but mother nature is a bitch and powerful and so it's like at, at the end of the day like if mother nature wants to hit us with a comet or hit us with this like you can't put everything on hold just because of so that's something that could happen right like obviously you want to minimize death but if it's safe enough to do stuff if i mean if airplanes are open and it's safe enough to fly then why is it not safe enough to have another event you know and so there's so yeah, much it's, tough, it's, a it's a tough situation. Super tough, so, right? Yeah. Like, but, I, but I think it'll open up and the people who want to do it and just have faith in, in themselves and their ability to fight off a, a virus, I think they'll just keep going, right? So, Are there any other fights coming up on this Saturday night that you're excited to see? I Honestly, I have not been able to see uh, – even the fight cards. I knew the major ones um, just from Twitter, but I didn't see the rest of the card. Um, Dude, honestly, I'm looking at this card right now. I didn't realize how good the card is. Who, who else is on it? I okay, heard, so yeah. I heard Mazadal is going to have one coming up that's like interesting. It didn't, that, didn't Dan White say Mazadal might have one? I love him. He's a beast. Yeah, he's good, man. No, so on this card you got under under the the main event you have um, Ngannou versus Rosenstruck. Then you have Jeremy Stevens versus Cal Calvin Qatar. I haven't heard of uh, Calvin. Then you got Greg Hardy versus Jorgen De Castro. Then on the prelims, the prelims honestly is looks like a better card than even the main event. You got Donald Cerrone versus Anthony Pettis. Okay. You got Alexi Olenek versus Fabrizio Verdum. Then you got Carla Esparza versus Michelle Watterson and Uriah Hall versus Jacare. I don't know those last two. Uriah Hall is he, he's the he's the the he's a middleweight. Was that? Is he a jujitsu guy? No. no, he's the guy that like you know sent that one dude to Valhalla with a fucking head kick on the Ultimate Fighter. Okay. Like, that was his claim to fame. He, like, he knocked somebody out so bad on the Ultimate Fighter. And then Jacare is Ronaldo Souza. He's, okay, um, I've heard of him. I've heard of him. 
I mean, he's one of the greatest uh, grapplers of all time. He's one of the greatest jujitsu guys of all time, and right, he, right. Uh, yeah, he's I mean, he's impressive. So that'll be yeah, interesting. No, as, as you said that again, I have heard of him, and I, I'm pretty sure he was one of the guys that you told me to watch. Um, Maybe I, I mean, some, as far as like, he hasn't done anything recently in grappling. No, no, it was all. It was all, definitely all footage. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, he 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 was the one that like back in I think the the early two thousands he had a match against Hodger Gracie. He let Hodger break his arm so that he could win the world title. Yeah, you. That was I. I, I want to say that was the one you you had me watch. I don't remember if I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even, no, even, I'm, even I'm pretty sure that's the one that match. Yeah, he's he's remarkable. But anyways, um. What are some grappling versus wrestling matchups that you want to see? I'm sure you want to see some stuff like that. I'm sure you enjoyed like watching that Bo Nickel versus uh, versus Gordon Ryan match. I'm assuming you saw that. Yeah, I'll tell you what though. Like, I love seeing it, but if any wrestler wants to do it, please consult me first. Like, Bo Nickel's game plan was trash, trash. <laughs> like, I'll straight up say it. It was trash. You know, like. It was cool to watch. I didn't see the Downey one. Um, I saw some highlights of it. Like, he's just big dog, uh, Gordon Ryan. And yeah. He's pushing him around. Um, but Downey's a fighter. I like it. Um, you know, I wish some other people would do it, but obviously they're fighting MMA. Like, I would love to see, like, Ed Ruth um, take on people. I mean, I've seen you know, some. Ed Ruth, Ed, I'm pretty sure Ed Ruth competes. He does, yeah, he's done, like, Pan Ams and stuff like that. Yeah. I would love to see him with, like, a super fight. He's amazing. He's uh, he's just so good. Um, but, no, I, I mean, just in general, like, I think it's going to be pretty cool moving forward to be able to see people have those super fights, you know? And, and grappling is grappling, right? Like, it's, again, you can control certain things. You can go in certain directions. Um, and, and so once people start really understanding that it doesn't really matter what the rules are, cause you're just going to be able to game it based on what you, the directions and control. Right. So when people really start thinking about it in that aspect, I think more to come and more people will challenge each other and, uh, and there'll be, and it'll revolutionize the scoring systems to a degree. Yeah. Speaking of which, uh, and this is something, I, again, I've, I've talked about with a lot of the active competitors that I've had on here, but I feel like you're going to bring a fresh perspective. Jiu-Jitsu has a lot of rule sets. Like, there's a lot of fucking rule sets in the sport, and there's always new ones being added in these hybrid rule sets. Do you think that that gets in the way of the sport being taken seriously? Like, what do you think Jiu-Jitsu needs to do to be taken more seriously as a no, spectator? Absolutely sport? not. Absolutely not. It's just standardizing something right like standardize getting one governing body would, would be what i would suggest um but the, interesting enough wrestling united world wrestling did a study the, they so many people in the wrestling community because they didn't really tell them why at first but so many people in the wrestling community specifically american they would get so mad they'd be like every year you change all these rules you change this you change that little rules big rules times like three minute two three minute periods one five minute period um, one six minute period, uh, three two minute periods, like it constantly changing the rules. And finally, they came out and they were like, Stop bitching. Like, you guys are like little whiny kids. Um, we changed the rules because these are elite level athletes and you can't game the system if you're constantly changing the rules. And so, every time they change rules, big or small, um, like if they do enough rule set changes, um, it increases scoring all the time. Right. So, so the more stagnant the rules are, the less scoring is going to happen. And so my philosophy would be change the rules often because people will learn the rules because they know the technical, technical, technical parts of the sport, but just have one governing body. <laughs> so I, when I say rule sets, I mean, like you might have ADCC rules, you know, one day, then the next day there's an EBI rules tournament and then the next weekend, there's an IBJJF rules tournament. Right, but that's because there's no one governing body. Everybody's trying to get dominance. Um, 
and that's fine too, right? Because there are different rule sets. There's freestyle, there's Greco, there's college for wrestling. But if there was one major outlet that says like, look, this is the number one world championship, um, make that the number one world championship and say, okay, well, here's the rule sets for the next year or two. And then we'll, then maybe we'll pull some from EBI. I will pull some from ADCC or whatever that is. And, and so now they're adapting rules from those smaller organizations, right? So there has to be one huge world championships that, um, that would be the standard. Um, but again, I, I think a lot of rule sets are good for the sport because it helps evolve and stop it from being stagnant. For sure, man. That's a, that's a great answer. Um, we're right here. We're, we're, we're about five minutes to the hour. I know you, you had some stuff you had to do today. Was there anything else that you wanted to talk about or that you wanted to kind of share with whoever's watching, you know, any, anything that you wanted to, to go into? No, I think, and I think we had a great conversation. You know, we talked about my current project uh, with Spartan and the training, um, you know, uh, you know, we talked about the technique and the physical development. Um, and I think that's the most applicable, right? Like we don't have time to get into the mental component, but, um, but yeah, I mean, just the, just the approach, right? Like if the biggest thing I could get out of this is, you know, combat sports are control and direction. And, and if you could change your mindset, it, it'll make you have, make people have a better understanding of, um, how to how to approach it right because you want to understand what you can control right and so what i tell the kids that i train um in kids meaning olympic level two you know i'm that old guy that calls everybody kids um <laughs> you know the first thing you can control is yourself right so your physical literacy the second thing you can control is the mat um so learn how to move move around the mat whether it's down on the ground up up on your feet um, be fluid in your movement on the mat, understand how to position your opponent without full engagement. Then you can control your attacks. Then once you attack, you can control the situation. And then once you can control the situation, you can control the finish. And if you understand those, you have a game plan and a, and a way of learning that you eliminate decisions because you have studied what to do you know, from those positions, right? You have a couple finishes, you have your A and B and you work backwards. You're okay from this position. These are the most important positions. And then over time you could get into the, you know, more, maybe more advanced positions, but positions you'd only get in at a high level. Um, and, and like I said, you know, attacks are like, are you going to be, are you going to be the early bird? Are you going to be the second mouse? Um, but number one, you have to be able to control yourself as a combat sport. So yeah, for sure. Well, um, I'm going to go ahead and just run through the schedule just one more time for anybody that might be interested in tuning in over the next few days. I try to build these schedules out about a week ahead of time. Uh, so tomorrow, 6.30 p.m., all times are Eastern Standard. I got Mike Mijas, who is Mr. Jiu-Jitsu. And Saturday at noon, I have the legendary leg locker, Joe Bays. Sunday, I have Eric Paulson at noon. Then next Monday, I have Josh LaDuke. Uh, we're talking at 5.30. Little Star-Lord, Gaylord. Then uh, Tuesday, I have Ulysses Bella of Ozomotli at 9 p.m. Wednesday is still TBD. Thursday, Nikki Sullivan at 7 p.m. And Friday, I have Nightmare Records owner and you know world-class singer Lance King, 6.30 p.m. Uh, thank you so much for coming on, Andy. It was a real pleasure to talk to you. Uh, hope to see you in person in the not too distant future. Okay. Okay. So, thank you, Emil. Hey, thanks, man. Yeah, take care. Bye. Good day.